Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon. Welcome back to our Asia, ASEAN workshop on sustainable development. Uh, this is plenary session number two for Science Panel of Southeast Asia. Uh, we are going to listen to four speakers. Uh, this is a very crucial uh, session whereby we need to conclude by about 4.15, 4.20 p.m. the latest because we are going into the plenary session at 4.30 p.m., which is very important also. We're going to listen to Emma Torres, uh, the Honourable Minister, uh, and a few others. So, timekeeping is very crucial. Uh, yeah, before I invite the speakers, let's uh, see who's the timekeeper. Yes, Mr. Timekeeper. Uh, for every speaker, you are go going to speak for only about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And when five minutes is up, the gentleman will put up the five-minute symbol, please. That one, speaker. Yeah, five minutes. And then the second, three minutes. And finally, time's up. If you don't stop, we shall call the security. <laughs> but anyway... This morning, we, we are very happy to have listened to uh, Mr. Jeff, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the minister, and also the, for the science uh, session, number one in LT5. It was good, a mixture of uh, presenters coming from economics, coming from community engagement, uh, coming from science. Uh, I think we are also going to have that mixture in this uh, session in the afternoon. At the end of the day, this session is about BioD protection for sustainable development. And in many countries, we are grappling with balancing uh, development and BioD protection. Uh, in Malaysia, uh, about 10 days ago, we heard the calling by the chairman of the Water Resources Council. Hey, Malaysia should already have a river basin authority. 10 days ago, John? We had the pleasure of interacting with Carlin May, the former Australian. Yes, we interacted with her at the International Sustainable Development Research Society uh, conference here in Kuala Lumpur. So she gave us some good advice about, you know, the experiences of Australia. But anyway, when you talk about BioD, it's forest, but we cannot. Ignore the nexus, you know, forest, energy, water. So these are the things which are very difficult. And we, when we saw Winston Peng, are you here, Winston? The auditor, the accountant who spoke in the other session this morning, it was very complicated indeed. How to factor these things in and put some value into it and how accountant and auditors, you know, should, should take into consideration BioD. Things are not easy, but we shouldn't give up. But anyway, we should carry on with discussion. That's why this afternoon session is very important. And the first to speak is Professor Muhammad Hanri Iman Shah, Professor at the Faculty of Economics and Business, Lambung Mangkurat University, Banjarmasin, Kalimantan. Uh, Professor Muhammad Hanri obtained John Crawford Scholarship to earn his PhD in Economics from the University of Queensland. Very good university, this one. We are both alumni. <laughs> <laughs> he has a wide experience in consultancy on macroeconomic policy, financial crisis modelling, fiscal decentralisation and environmental economics. He has uh, performed research and worked with ADB, GIZ, DFID, long list. Very good. He served as expert team member to provide policy brief for fiscal incentive on green industry for Ministry of Industry Indonesia, 2020-2022. He's a visiting lecturer at University of Malaya in 2009. He obtained research grant from Bank Indonesia 2021, looking at the impact of digital economy to achieve green economy in Indonesia. Please welcome Professor Muhammad Hanri Iman Shah.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers and distinguished uh, participants. I want to discuss about the economic transformation to achieve sustainable development goals in Kalimantan. But this is only a case study for South Kalimantan. I hope that Kalimantan has the same uh, research, I mean, to prepare the green economy. We know that the climate change and various natural phenomena occurring in the world can trigger environmental damage and impact on, on human uh, quality of life. The increase in carbon emission has on an upward trend. So he, this is the highest contributor to the greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emission in the world. So this is contribute to the climate change. Therefore, uh, economic development of a country or a region needs to be directed, directed towards growth and sustainable development. Sustainable development is generally presented as a framework consisting of three elements, high economic growth, good environment or environmentally friendly, and also equitable social uh, equity. As we know that the United Nations Environment Program defines that the concept of green economy as an economic paradigm that improves well-being, so improve uh, welfare. Also social equity or social income distribution, as well as uh, to improve environmental degradation. As we know that the European Union has provided various stimuli to move towards a green economy by allocating 30% of the 750 billion uh, euro stimulus package and allocating 50 15 euro billion uh, for environmentally friendly vehicle investment. Indonesia also launched uh, green economic policies in 2020-2024 National Medium Term Development Plan with various emission reduction target uh, for NDC enhanced this, uh, national dip. Uh, determined contribution is almost 32 percent reduction through domestic effort and 43.2 with international assistance compared to the business as usual. So green economy is also one of the strategy for national economic transformation to achieve Indonesia visions for 2045 and fulfill the Paris Agreement. South Kalimantan, of course, should contribute to the national agenda to reduce carbon emission to achieve green economy or sustainable development. As we know that most of the Kalimantan province has started to industrialize their economy. And we know that industrialization needs more energy. And most of the energy is based on coal. So if uh, Kalimantan, uh, all of the Kalimantan start to industrialize their economy, of course, they will contribute to the carbon emission. So we have to identify of the sectors that comply with the green economy indicators. The green economy indicators, there are three uh, macro indicators. The first one is high economic growth. Why high economic growth? Because high economic growth can uh, fulfill to improve 
welfare. The second indicator is uh, environmental friendly. And the third indicator is income distribution, so social inclusive. My research is uh, using um, input output analysis that we can uh, see whether the one sector is important in providing the, the economy, the high economic growth. The second one is we can see whether this sector is comply with the environmental friendly. For this indicator, we use carbon emission. This, the third one is uh, what about the impact to the income distribution. Based on the government sectoral priority, there are 12 sectors in South Kalimantan that they want to be developed. Most of the sectors are agriculture sectors and forestry and the processing uh, industry for coal. So they want to make a conversion from coal to, to gas. The next one is food and beverage industry. This is part of the uh, agriculture processing sectors. And as, as well, the wood and wood product industry is part of the uh, processing sector from the forest. And rubber as well, a part of the uh, rubber production uh, processing sectors. And the last one is metal, uh, basic metal industry. Be because we have, uh, okay, we have some uh, metal mining. So they want to process this this uh, sector. Based on this uh, calculation, most of the sectors that to be developed are in, in, uh, in the highest output multiplier. So it can meet the, the requirement to become a, a first indicator. The second one indicator is lowest carbon multiplier. So most of the 12 sector is a part of the lowest carbon multiplier. So based on this one, we try to impact if we want to see uh, whether this 12 sector uh, provide income distribution better on or worsen. Based on this one, uh, we, we can see that the top 20 income group received 41% benefit for rural and 47% for urban population. The second middle income group of 30% received 36% benefit for the rural and 37% for the urban population. The last one is the lowest 40% income group received 22% benefit uh, for rural and 80% for urban population. We can see that based on this uh, impact, the impact for uh, income group is moderate. I mean, it's not so bad because uh, based on the bank, uh, World Bank criteria, if there is uh, the lowest 40 percent income group receive of the between 12 until 70 percent is uh, moderate uh, i mean the the income uh, the equality is inequality is is okay I and mean moderate so uh, the sector selected for prioritization generally have high output multipliers and low carbon multipliers this means that if this sector are developed, the growth of this sector will not result in significant carbon emission. If this sector are chosen for development, their impact on income distribution is relatively moderate. This implies that the transition to a green economy can be achieved because the selected sector meet the criteria of high output growth, 
with relatively low carbon emission and inclusiveness. Okay, uh, that's all my uh, sharing about the case of South Kalimantan. I hope if all of the province in Kalimantan choose the development strategy, they have to identify first which one the sectors to be developed because the impact of the priority sector will worsen the income distribution. Thank you very much. Terima kasih Bapak Muhammad Hendri. Thank you very much Professor Muhammad Hendri Iman Shah. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Elia Godung. She's a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Tropical Forestry, University of Malaysia Sabah, uh, up until June 2021. And then she got transferred to Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation from May. Is that right? Yeah, correct. From May 2nd. Uh, oh no, they got it mixed up. Okay. But you are now with the Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation. University of Malaysia Sabah. Uh, I think in the whole of Malaysia, uh, the most beautiful campus is University of Malaysia Sabah. You know, especially the Chancellery overlooking the Sepanga Bay. Beautiful. Emma Torres, you must visit University of Malaysia Sabah. Currently, she is the director at the Center for Sustainable Society Engagement. CSSE. Uh, now we know what this stands for. Center for Sustainable Society Engagement, University of Malaysia Sabah. She graduated with a PhD degree from University of Zurich, Switzerland. Wow, nice place. Zurich, one of the most expensive cities in the world. I don't know how you survive. <laughs> she graduated from University of Zurich, Switzerland in natural science at the Institute of Evolutionary Biology and Environmental Studies. She specializes in forest conservation ecology, integrating GIS and remote sensing technology in habitat utilization model. Dr. Helia has a wide-ranging academic and professional expertise in forest conservation ecology and management, integrating geographic information system and remote sensing technology high conservation value forests, forest rehabilitation, restoration, and carbon sequestration. Sounded like a future Minister for Environment. <laughs> please, which, without much ado, please welcome Dr. Elia. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for the very um, impressive uh, introduction from our moderator, Dr. Mazlin. Okay, um, my, my background is on the forestry. Uh, what the doctor tried to say just now is I'm actually uh, firstly joined the uh, Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation and now I'm in the fo Faculty of Forestry for academic um, part and um, leading the Center for uh, Society Engagement, uh, Sustainability, uh, Society Engagement now in UMS. So um, uh, I, today I'm going to share you what we are doing with the community to help combating the climate change. So what we introduce in UMS is a focused community. Our terms of um, focused community is um, something like we choose one area and then we um, establish a few projects uh, or program to the community. So in, in one um, big community, we have a sub-communities. And uh, for example, we name the communities. It's a mama communities, it's a papa -pa communities. In Malay, we have Belia, the Ramaja communities, and also the Beliau Beliau. Beliau means it's the senior, senior, uh, <laughs> senior um, community. So we just name them and give them a project. So why we did this um, um, module? Because we want to um, give everyone chance to have a uh, chance to benefit from each uh, 
project from the other com um, sub communities. So if the papa fail, the mama success. So the papa still benefit from the projects from the um, the, the mama communities. So this is what we try to um, introduce from UMS. And then the projects we select, um, it's not only to change their behavior, or also we give them skills and try to make this, um, uh, transform the, the way they're thinking to be more aspiration uh, community. And also something uh, we, we provide expert, uh, from our expert, um, we, we transfer the knowledge, okay? We transfer knowledge for them to uh, help to enhance their socioeconomic. At the same time, we are making these communities busy with their daily life to protect the environment. So, this is what we uh, focused. So, um, we... Um, try to maintain the three pillars of the sustainability development, the, um, the environment, social, and also the economic. So um, each project that uh, each knowledge transferred to the community must have this element to make sure that this project is sustained. And then um, it's simple like this. We don't give them fish, but we give them um, fishing rod, yeah. So this is how we uh, transfer the knowledge to the community. So where they get the knowledge? We have uh, many experts from the universities, from economic side, from the art side, from the science, and um, also um, even um, engineer. We can um, share the knowledge to the community who don't have the opportunity to join study in the university. So. The impact was um, value, and we measured the impact by uh, giving them um, a questionnaire and asking them some questions to lead what we need to know from the community. So, um, for example, last time our community, they make um, parang, the, the knife, um, and then they can only sell the parang with 14 ringgits, but now they can sell it like um, 80 ringgits or 140 ringgits. It's double the price because we bring our experts to, to teach them how to put, to, to, to uh, fit the, the motif in the arts of the, of the design of the parang, of the knife. And also, at the same time, instead of they're doing this, uh, making parang using a traditional way, uh, they cut trees and um, collecting trees release uh, more um, carbon emission. We introduce them solar system and using um, a modern um, modern technology to produce these um, goods for them to sell out and um, get more income. Also, um, some of the projects um, in the in the uh, community is like how. We teach them the, how to use solar to reduce this um, environment um, carbon emission. And then um, they now know that what is the, the benefit from um, applying the solar system. Also, we teach them doing agronomy and fertigation technology instead of opening a new land for um, shifting cultivation something like that. And also, we, did, uh, we, we, we do some um, awareness program as well. And some of the activities, like they introduce Tagal. Tagal is in, in Bahasa Dusun, in Dusun language in Sabah, means don't. So Tagal is very popular to, uh, to conserve the river and the fish from the river. So um, it said, don't, don't do that. So in, the fish is the main um, main um, attraction in that river. So at the same time, we teach this community how to sustain their, their activities, and there we come to teach them how to plant trees and how to take care of the riparian of the river so that the, the, the fish also benefited from the ecological function. 
So this is how we, we, we match the science and also the community's um, um, behavior to try to achieve um, our mission to sustain the global um, uh, climate change. So we also teach them um, um, by showing them what is the technology remote sensing can do, even though they are doing it without my eyes looking at them, but the satellite can, can detect their activities, so they are very excited, and um, that's make them uh, really um, innovative now. And then, um, we try to produce or to, to um, establish the focus community, at least one focus community in each district in Sabah. So um, to, to implement all this uh, sustainable um, uh, requirement. So this is just the examples of our, our project. We also have some um, fund from the, our ministry and also our own universities, and some from NGOs and also our collaborators. So this is um, now ongoing and established um, focus community. This one also. Um, uh, okay. So this is um, what we do with the another um, effort. We do the the conservation area community focus community engagement. So conservation area is actually, uh, it's not um, a set, there is no settlement for community. The community lives in there is only the staffs who are taking care of the conservation area because this is a first class um, forest reserve. So you are not allowed to even pick a single um, leaves of the trees or disturb any of the biodiversity. How we help them is to introduce some of the um, agronomy and um, high technologies uh, activities for, to them, to help them to have their own um, um, food. Uh, this is something about food security. So th these people are taking about two or three hours to going out to the city to get fresh food, even uh, uh, vegetables. So now they are, we are teaching them also how to convert all this um, rubbish, uh, the, the garbage, and also the um, forest debris into a, a useful um, source like um, compost things, and then you can sell it as well, uh, as long as this are not disturbing the conservation area. So this is the effort that we do in university to uh, combat uh, the climate change. So we not engage only the people outside the village, also the outside of our university fans, but also uh, the community who lives remotely deep inside the forest. So if you see, this is the, the situation of our uh, deforest deforestation or forest degradation um, until 2020, this, um, this map in front here. So you can see the, how it's declined from here, and then now it's um, very, the, the dark green indicate the, the forest. So we only have this in Borneo. So this one, the, the green here, you can see it actually uh, part of the heart of Borneo that we have to conserve and protect and worldwide. So um, that's all my sharing for today. I think we can um, discuss more on the question and answer. Thank you very much. Terima kasih, Dr. Elia. Thank you very much. So even though she said uh, that's all she's going to do the sharing, she's going to do a lot more sharing later when you are seated here. But anyway, uh, yeah, this morning also we listened to Professor Junena. Junena, yeah. She also shared a view, beautiful 10-minute video this morning about her study area. And Dr. Elia, you are with UMS. So University College Sabah Foundation and University Malaysia Sabah and all of us, we shall work together of how to, to balance development and protection of BioD, inshallah. So the third speaker, ah, this is young uh, Dr. Elia said Beliau. The senior, senior community. is a good friend. 
Dr. Gopinath Nagaraj. Uh, is a fisheries and marine environmental uh, specialist with a wide experience in the sustainable development and management of living aquatic resources in Malaysia. A good friend of mine. We went back a long way. We were in the same committee of BP, British Petroleum Special Committee on Environment and BioD, many, many years back. So thank you, Gopinath, for coming. Uh, he obtained his uh, Bachelor of Science in Aquatic Biology and Fisheries Management from University Science Malaysia in Penang, and tertiary degrees in aquaculture oh, from University of the Philippines, Auburn University, and his PhD from Nottingham University. Congratulations. Uh, a good example of lifelong learning. You obtained your PhD 2021, right? I, I, I found your thesis last night. <laughs> it's about recreational fishery. So you Google Gopinath Nagarash, Nottingham University, Malaysia, you will find his thesis. Well, quite a lot, nearly 300 pages. I fell asleep after the third page. <laughs> he joined the Department of Fisheries, Malaysia in 1978, followed by a stint as the Managing Director of Sindel Asia, Sindiran Berhad, the Asian branch of a leading global distributor of aquatic pharmaceuticals from 2004 until 2006. He joined Funly Marine and Consultancy, which is currently you are attached to, uh, a leading Malaysian-based fishery and aquaculture consultancy company uh, in 1997, and is now uh, its principal consultant. His portfolio has covered nearly 300 projects. Wow, I will calculate how much you have. In addition to Malaysia, he has worked in Myanmar, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, India, Bangladesh, and Brunei Darussalam in varying capacities. He has also overseen studies in Timor-Leste. Please welcome Dr. Gopinath Nagaraj. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Maslin, for such a kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Maslin and I go back a long way, we're old friends. Uh, my discussion actually is going to center on the marine environment in ASEAN. And, and it's a very complicated subject. And what I would like to do is just give you an overview of the sustainability outlook, not even the issues, outlook on the region. Now, we have heard a lot throughout the last, uh, uh, this morning session and this afternoon as well on forests, and we were looking at the terrestrial side. But I'd like to show you some, a map now, and this is Southeast Asia. And if you look at Southeast Asia, starting from Philippines, right up to Sumatra, and the west coast of Sumatra, you'll find that actually Southeast Asia, ASEAN's marine estate is bigger than its land. Yet, our focus is on the land. And that's because we are terrestrial creatures. We tend to look towards the land. But there's a difference between ASEAN and any other part of the world. And that comes the second part. Here, we look at land area as compared to coastline. And when you look at it, you can see like in the uh, US, 459 square kilometers per kilometer of coastline or China, 408, uh, uh, India, 480, or China, 643 square kilometers per kilometer of coastline. Then you come to Indonesia, 33.1. Land area compared to coastline. Philippines, 8.22. In other words, the communities that lived in these places, they didn't look at the land, looked outward towards the sea. And the sea was their source of food, their source of economic growth, their source of, of, uh, of trade. So they were looking out there. Their culture revolved around the sea. So you can see that archipelagic Southeast Asia in particular, the marine waters are critically important. Okay. Now, what hobbles sustainability in our marine environment? 
there are two fundamental perceptions. One is that marine waters and the living resources there are infinite. Where you got water, you got fish. But we know this is wrong. Oil is finite, sand is finite, and unfortunately, fish is also finite. And now we find that in many places, we have declining fisheries resources because we have taken that resource for granted. Now, the other thing that we have, a misperception, is that our oceans can handle everything we throw at it. And we'd like to believe that this is a function of poverty. But the reality is that the, the, the factory worker that goes to the beach and throws his plastic bag in the water and the, uh, the billionaire that owns an oil tanker that pumps oil into the sea, both suffer from the same problem. Their perception that the sea can take, a, take anything you throw at it. And that is another fallacy. Now, why do you have that? Where does the fallacy come from? It comes from the fundamental idea, if I don't see a problem, it doesn't exist. But we all know that it does exist. You know? Now, we have... What have we done? In terms of urban development, in terms of economic development, there has been this effort to be sustainable on land, to maintain forests, to maintain uh, 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 sanctuaries, and so on. The marine area, that effort is, is relatively recent. You see it beginning in the 80s. But in the past, we didn't bother with it. And now we see so much has been lost and so much continues to be the lost, continues to be lost. Now, this is not a small matter in this region. The Coral Triangle Initiative, which is centered around Sabah and Indonesia, and part of Philippine Islands, has actually shown this area to be the most uh, biodiverse marine area in the world. And we are losing it bit by bit. We're losing our coral reefs, we're losing our habitats like mangroves. Mangroves are being cleared. And mangroves are not just terrestrial habitats, they are an interface between the marine habitat and the land habitat. Right? We're losing our seagrass. All our seagrass, most of our seagrass breads have, been, have disappeared. And this is the whole problem. Again, sustainability works on what we can see. We can see mangroves, we should develop it. We see, don't see seagrass, we still clear it but through the reclamation and so on. Coral reefs, now it's got value because people go diving. But if we didn't have that value, we would have destroyed the coral reefs as well. Now, you can see this picture is a picture of all these forces that work towards destroying our habitats. Now, you destroy the habitat, you destroy the home of the fish. And you destroy the home of the fish, you don't have fish. And it affects your food. Okay? That's not the only impact it's got. The marine environment has got so many uses, so many, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, services that these services are all compromised by the loss of, of, of uh, our habitats, marine habitats, and that I'm including water quality. You know? If we destroy water quality, it affects our use of the of those oceans in terms of recreation, in terms of fisheries, in terms of uh, any other use that you want to put it to, even though at one point or another, we are probably going to look at desalination, and when we come down to it, we are going to find that desalination is an issue because what we have thrown in the water has made it so toxic, we can't use it for any other purpose. Now, i give you an example of habitat loss. We, when we isolate the terrestrial environment from the marine environment, and we assume there is a border, and this one doesn't affect the other. But the reality is it, everything is interconnected. This after morning, we had a talk about uh, the uh, program from ridge to reef. Because there is a continuum from when you look upstream, right up to the moment what the river is formed, right up to the, form, the, reef, uh, the reef is formed in the marine environment, there is a linkage. And that linkage must be seen in its totality. Now, I'll give you an example of how we can, be, we can affect uh, uh, habitat loss affects terrestrial areas. You lose the mangrove in this picture, the mangrove is lost. As a consequence of that, you have coastal flooding. Then what do you do? You go back to the government, the government does engineering structures, like revetments, and it, that further degrades the environment. So where is the sustainability in this? You will not find a sustainable solution by putting an engineering solution where a natural solution existed. So sustainability in the marine environment is looking at that environment in its totality in terms of its values. But what we are doing 
is we are mining the marine environment. Okay? I give you an example of what you mean by mining. When you say to use the word mining, I'm taking something out of the ground that took uh, millions of years of geological processes to create. I had to create iron, I had to create tin. In this country, these two were major commodities in the 60s. We were the world's second largest exporter of iron. Today, not one piece, one uh, uh, bit of iron leaves this country because we overused it, we taxed it, we removed more from the environment than the environment is able to replace. Now, for most part, biological resources can be renewed. They can renew themselves, and the marine environment can actually be a self-propagating environment. It can self-rehabilitating environment, but you have to give it that chance. Okay. Now, in terms of sustainability, the ability to maintain and support a process continuously over time. You don't understand the process, we must make an effort to understand the process. And we must understand that in the marine environment, that loss of your marine resources is going to have the impact that I mentioned earlier on, on your culture, on your food resources, on your economy. All these are going to be affected by the fact that you do not sustain what can be sustained, what can be self-renewing. And this is the tragedy of the commons. When you go down to the beach, you see uh, debris there, you see plastics there, you see garbage there, you see nets being thrown up because they are uh, ghost netting. Fishermen lose nets at sea. And you know, at one point, nets were made out of uh, uh, natural fibers. Now they're all made out of plastics. They stay there forever, and they, they, they damage the resource immensely. Yet we do not see this, but it's happening throughout. You know, and some of the work that we did in Sabah, we were pulling up nets, uh, what do you call this, ghost nets, by the dozen in a given area because they had been abandoned for many, many years. And they were still fishing. The fishermen had gone, but the ghost nets were still fishing. Okay. Now, in conclusion, and I'm being, is this, I'm, I'm still in time, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. It's very easy to get bored on, uh, I, I'm very easily, bore people on this subject, so I'm being very brief, okay? <laughs> so, listen, we have to give the living systems chance to adapt and change. And this can happen in the marine environment as it can happen in the terrestrial environment. And what we are lacking is an ASEAN focus on the marine environment. We, there is a legitimate focus on, on forestry, but outside of CTI, the Coral Triangle Initiative, there's no been an ASEAN, broad ASEAN initiative on, on, uh, uh, on the marine environment as a whole. There have been, I, to be fair, there have been efforts. Right now, for instance, there is an effort on hydrocarbons. And if I go back on the map, you will see that one of the blessings we've got, if you want to call it blessing, is the Straits of Malacca, which is the most heavily traveled uh, straits, shipping straits in the world. Most of our oil that goes to China goes through that straits. And most of the ships that discharge oil, discharge it there and in the Johor Straits. So we have plenty of oil in this country, but we don't have to pump it from the ground. We just have to take it from the seawater. <laughs> this is an unfortunate part of it. But that hydrocarbon actually has an impact on marine environment, on rendering resources, on the ability of marine life to sustain itself and to self-renew. And these are important issues to consider. What we need to see is, I cannot see, or we cannot see, Straits of Malacca in isolation of Andaman Sea or in isolation of South China Sea. They are all interlinked. And in, we're looking at the hydrodynamics, a lot of them flow from one to another. What you need is a regional approach in looking at your marine environment and taking a regional approach in trying to mitigate the very worst effects of human activity on this environment. Otherwise, the people in this area, of, uh, particularly of Apikalagic ASEAN, are going to be the final victims. With that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah, very spirited Gopinathan there. Gopira, Gopi, yeah? Thank you. But anyway, thank you for presenting the case about connectivity. So he even though he spoke about marine system, but don't forget about interconnectedness with the coastal system and the land system. So that is why 
this SDSN, Emma Torres, John, flew from faraway places coming here because SDSN would like to bring all of us together, particularly researchers, looking at this big picture. So in our area for the science panel of Southeast Asia, of course, we want to bring all the, oh, if you, oh, Southeast Asia is 10 countries. But if you look at this office, SDSN Asia, we're looking at more than 10 countries. But we begin with Southeast Asia. But even with Southeast Asia, we look at some of the existing programs and projects which are ongoing. One is Heart of Borneo, which was launched in 2007, June. So that's, that's about 16 years old. And the other one is the Coral Triangle Initiative, CTI, which uh, Gopi mentioned, which was launched in 2009. So that's about 14 years old. But anyway, these are some of the exciting progress which had been made and which we can build upon better. How to do it better? How to build back better? So these are some of the strategies which we hope after you check out from this program, don't sit quietly, but we should keep on communicating. Uh, the keyword is communicate, and the fourth and the last speaker, certainly not the least, will speak about communication. His name is Dr. Minhas. Dr. Minhas is a university lecturer and research fellow at the Institute for Environment and Development, short form Lestari, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Malaysian National University. He obtained PhD on Environment and Development from UKM. Uh, Dr. Minha's research interests are on WEMC Square, we borrow from Einstein. Water, Education, Management, Communication and Collaboration, EMC Square. Education, Management, Communication and Collaboration, very clever. Uh, which is in line with aspirations of IWRM, Integrated Water Resources Management. John Twites is uh, the former, you were the former Deputy Chief Minister of, is it Western Australia or South Australia? Victoria. Victoria, Victoria. I got the state wrong. <laughs> Sorry, John. So, you see, even when he has retired, he still comes back just to give us motivation and to keep on discussing the unfinished business of IWRM and the Sustainable Development Goals, including DRR, Disaster Risk Reduction. This morning we heard and we saw the complicated diagram of Winston Peng, the perspective of accountant and auditor, how they look at risk, very complicated. When you look at it, you want to give up doing things, but please don't give up. So this DRR approach for ecological systems management. And Dr. Minhas is also interested in climate change adaptation and mitigation. Prior to coming to Malaysia, he has worked with UNICEF and also SIDA, Sweden, International Development Authority. Uh, Dr. Minhas has a special role in the Malaysia's National Water Sector Transformation Program 2040 which is led by Economic Planning Unit and Academy of Sciences Malaysia. He is the MCL, Module Cluster Leader, preparing the Module for Government Officer of Malaysia. 600 pages. Yeah. This one, I read six pages and you know what happened. <laughs> but never, that one, another story. But for now, please welcome Dr. Minhas to speak about communication and biodi protection. Assalamualaikum. Uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Prof. Dato Mazlin, for a very nice introduction. Uh, I'm here to talk about sustainable science, its communications for uh, environmental management uh, to contribute in broader sustainable development. So I want to start with this uh, quotation from Prof. Gus Spitt, which has been viral in social media uh, a few years back. 
So Prof. Gus Spitt is one of the pioneers in producing the Human Development Report Series by UNDP. So he commented that, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, <laughs> ecosystem collapse, and climate change. And he thought with the good signs in his career about 30 years, he could solve the, those problems. But he was wrong. He mentioned that the top in environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with this, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. That means science alone cannot solve the problem. We need both science and technology, as well as social science and humanities to solve the problem of our current world. So this is a country strategy report from UNESCO promoting the uh, sustainability science application to accelerate the implementation of sustainable development goals. And uh, did an uh, regional director of UNESCO, Jakarta Office, uh, this inaugurated at UKM still also. And uh, you can see in the picture from Dato Mazlin, the then DVC of uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of University Kabangsang, Malaysia, also present there. So we got the opportunity to implement a project uh, on sustainable designs. It's called UNESCO AP First. AP First defines what Asia Pacific facilitated. Uh, facilitated acceler acceleration of science and technology. The project is to uh, the role of local authority in sustainable water resources management at Longkabi, Malaysia, towards achieving SDGs. So we have been successfully identified uh, that academia can perform as a, a memory keeper. I mean, the role of the academia can be memory keeper in the multi-stakeholders platform to facilitate the decision-making process of local government. Because the local government, the boss, and the officials, high-ranking officials, always changing within one or two years, especially in the case of Malaysia. So, so the academia can, be the, uh, can fulfill the gap uh, with the knowledge. So when the academia perform this one, they can validate the data and information. So the authenticity of the data and information is there. So the decision making uh, we hope could be the uh, more accurate. So here also uh, we established uh, that in the framework that social science and humanities along with science and technology is very important in decision making and uh, multi-stakeholder platform plays a vital role. So this has been accepted as a policy paper by UNESCO also. So following this, uh, we implemented uh, our findings through the MUCP, that is called Malaysia UNESCO Cooperation Program. The collaboration and cooperation, not only the national uh, stakeholders, the multi-stakeholders, but also the international multi-stakeholders. You can see the uh, pictures there, these are the uh, multi-stakeholders based in Longkabi, Malaysia, the island, beautiful island, the business sector, the academia, uh, the civil society, the NGO, everybody is there. So uh, meeting with the local government of uh, Longkabi to solve the problems, especially implementing the sustainable development goals, to achieving sustainable development goals. So uh, this is another example of promoting sustainability science, whereas a business sector is taking the leadership roles. To our knowledge, this, uh, this hotel called named Frangipani Hotel and Spa in Longkavi is one of the finest hotel who is practicing the sustainable development, uh, sustainability uh, initiatives. For example, uh, they have the 10 branches in their hotel, uh, starting from the front desk to, until to the environment, their security officers. So in every sector, they are promoting the uh, green practices. For example, collecting the rainwater, 
reusing, recycling the waste water from the constructed wetlands. They also have the eco tour for the all their guests every week. Uh, so, uh, in a way, the owner of the Franjibani Hotel and Spa, adjunct professor Anthony Wang, playing a very important leadership role from the business sector, inviting uh, academia community to take part in sustainable management of hotel to promote the sustainable tourism, which is a green, a green growth for the country also. So apart from the business sector, the government agency is also coming forward. For example, the Islamic Institute, Islamic, uh, Institute of Islamic Understanding of Malaysia also publishing the book on religious responses to climate change and environmental degradation. So they also coming forward and uh, we have also contributed uh, chapters on integrated water resources management to respond to climate change and environmental degradation. So in Malaysia, there are many good policy, books, reports, experts, and institutions that are there. Problem is the implementation of the good policies at the local level. So that's why uh, this special uh, study from the Economic Planning Unit of Malaysia via the Academy of Sciences Malaysia is started. It's called Water Sectors Transformation 2040. So it's a 20 years project starting from the 12 five year Malaysia plan in 2022 until the 15 Malaysia plan 2040 year. So by this time, it is hoped that uh, the uh, stakeholder, multi stakeholders, especially the government, business sector, academia and community NGO uh, sh should have the proper capacity building and at the end, Malaysia would be the a regional hub and as well as the global hub of training of other countries to train on integrated water resources management so that it can be uh, contribute to the national GDP of Malaysia also. So under this project, we, are, uh, we have produced uh, uh, four uh, training module. So as mentioned by Prof. Dato Mazlun, Mazlin bin Mokhtar, he is the chair of this special uh, study. Uh, I have produced one module for the government official of Malaysia. There are three others module produced by the three other officials. So you can Google this in the online. Uh, Economic Planning Unit of Malaysia has already uploaded for all the people. So when you talk uh, about the module, uh, we have already done uh, preparing the modules, so it's now the time to train the local government official and other important stakeholders, especially at the local level. So our study, especially at the Langat River Basin, Malaysia, which is the UNESCO Help River Basin. So uh, we identified the uh, identified that the local government has the capacity based uh, capacity of enforcement based on the uh, local Government Act 1946. So they have the enforcement capability as well as the collaboration to form the collaboration not only with the other local governments within the Selangor state, but also the uh, other local government in other states because Langat River is a transboundary river basin which, is, which crosses uh, Selangor state, Negeri Sembilan states and the federal territories of Kuala Lumpur and so uh, when we're talking about the uh, sustainable science and its communication, uh, if we think about, uh, talk about the system thinking following the SEPA model, that is communication, education, education and public awareness. So uh, we think if it can be uh, modified a little bit, if can bring the collaboration along with communication. So there will be more uh, 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 improvement in the management process. If there is a good collaboration based on the communication uh, and multi-stakeholder platform can be a good tool for the better communication. And if uh, collaboration happens and uh, cooperation there remains and 
continuous networking uh, remain for the new knowledge uh, new knowledge so there has the opportunity for the better ecological system management for sustainable development so this is a conceptual framework from us so far we have prepared so uh, thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Minhas Farid Ahmed. So that concludes with the formal presentation. I'm so glad uh, Minhas brought up the issue about integrated water resource management. We heard from Dr. Gopi, hmm, don't forget about ICZM, Integrated Coastal Zone Management, and your PhD is about EAFM, Ecosystems Approach to Fisheries Management. You see, ladies and gentlemen, to bring us to sustainable development, there are so many integrated and holistic approaches. Tepuk dada, tanya selera. I don't know how to translate in English. Gopi, you figure it out. Whatever you wish, you can choose. Uh, you choose the medicine. How to bring you to sustainable development? If you ask Ibrahim Komo, he will choose Global Geopark. If you ask Gopi, EAFM. Uh, ecosystems approach to fishery management. If you ask Sarah Aziz Lestari, oh, I see ZM, integrated coastal zone management. If you ask Minhas, IWRM, integrated water resource management. I say, no, 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 go IRBM, integrated river basin management. All are important and relevant. It's just what do you put in the middle. Uh, that's it. But if you look at the elements, it's similar. You must work together. You must bring social science and science and technology together. And today, what do you hear? Planetary health. So on and so on. But whatever it is, don't give up. Keep on doing it. But what's important? Emma would say and John would say, finding solutions is the most important. And where are the solutions? Please don't look at me. <laughs> Whenever we point, there are so many more fingers pointing towards ourselves. Ah, so that's the spirit. And to discuss about that, I'm going to invite all you four speakers. Please come up. There are plenty of time for question and answer. Yeah. Please. Professor Muhammad Hanri, Iman Shah, Dr. Elia, Dr. Gopi, and uh, Dr. Minhas. Find your favorite chair and find your favorite microphone. So ladies and gentlemen, including our friends who are following via online, yeah, even though we spoke a little bit, a little bit much more about Borneo and all that, but certainly we don't forget the peninsula Malaysia and other parts of other countries within ASEAN and all that. So in Malaysia, if in, in Sabah and Sarawak and Indonesia and Brunei Darussalam, we have heart of Borneo, in Peninsular Malaysia, we have CFS, Central Forest Pine. If you Google CFS, yeah, you will be directed to a good uh, website. All of these are being coordinated by NRECC, Natural Resource Environment Climate Change uh, Ministry. Uh, the Honourable Minister gave a good speech this morning. But anyway, we, we have 36 minutes. So maybe we shall begin with... Three questions first. Uh, facilitator, you have the microphone? Yeah, Mamoko and Shankar and what's your name, sir? Aslan. Aslan. So, who are brave enough to ask a question? In Malaysia, ah, yeah, we always say ladies first, yeah. <laughs> please. Uh, please bring the microphone. Please uh, introduce yourself and the institution you're coming from. Okay, I'm not from an institution. I'm actually from the private sector. Um, I'm Dr. Serena Ismail from IOI Corporation. I'm the Group Head of Sustainability. Oh. Um, part of what we do um, is also looking at biodiversity. Uh, we are a member of the National uh, Advisory um, uh, Group uh, for the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, this is in support of the, the, the national uh, biodiversity po policy. So it's interesting to see the perspective 
from the academic, because um, I assume all of you are from the academic. I think maybe Dr. Gobi, maybe not is. Uh, but um, I think what we like from the cooperation is to see what you guys can help us in some of the more statistical I don't know, research uh, information to help us to implement uh, biodiversity. Um, part of the target of the, um, the global biodiversity framework was to make biodiversity um, uh, streamline into something that is part and parcel of the corporations. So possibly I will just direct to all of you because I know that uh, you know we work in, in Sabah um, at Lahat Datu area. Um, in some of the areas it's in Kinabatangan, but, uh, and also in Peninsula with uh, the elephants. And so I just want to see, I mean, I, I know that we've worked a little bit with like University of Nottingham and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure some of the perspective that you guys come up is something that, you know, we can implement because I know, uh, you know, a lot of things that is being done, a lot of things needs to be implemented. And I think this is generally implemented by the private sector. So I think that's my question to all of you. How would you want to col collaborate with us? Not put it to the point that it's such an academic, at an mm. academic level, but more on a practical implementation area. Because I, I see the directions that is going on. It's quite academic. All right, Thanks. thank you. Your name again, ma'am? Serena is my name. Zurina. Su. Zurina. Thank you. And you are the Chief Sustainability Officer of IOI Group? IOI Corporation. Corporation. CSO. No. Group Head. Group Head Sustainability. Uh, yes, second question, please. Yeah, another. Oh, Lavanya. But please introduce your name again. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Lavanya Rama Ayer from uh, WWF Malaysia. Uh, just wanted to um, pick up on the first slide that Dr. Minha showed just now. A very powerful slide, I think. Um, and I think that really goes to the root cause of why our, so our current models of progress or prosperity have not really de delivered the development that we need uh, we, we should be seeing. I'm just wondering what would all of you suggest uh, we should do to address that fundamental problem? Because I think if we don't move away from that fundamental problem, um, you know, we will be still fighting, you know, little fires <laughs> or putting out the smoke rather than, you know, fighting the actual fire. Should we be looking at, you know, measuring progress differently or beyond GDP, like what the UN Secretary General has been calling for. Now, how do you see that uh, within the context of uh, biodiversity? Thank you. Thank you. One more? One gentleman, perhaps? Ah, another lady, please. <laughs> it's okay. Men after lunch, they, you know, a bit heavy on their eyes. One microphone. Mamoko, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good so afternoon. I'm Valerie Barbosa. I'm an ocean scientist, but I'm currently the science officer at the Embassy of France to Malaysia. Oh, bonjour. So, <laughs> bonjour. Um, so I, I, <clears throat> one of the speakers mentioned there's obviously, for example, a lack of collaboration, of sufficient collaboration, maybe at regional level. Uh, but in our work, especially on the oceans, we do see that one of the obstacles we have is also the fragmentation in the management of oceans and coastal areas. Uh, the example is Malaysia, but it could work elsewhere, right? So I don't know, I would like to ask the whole panel, um, how could we address this? Mm. Because like communication or intergovernmental cooperation, it's already kind of difficult, so then how we match it with the other sectors? So I guess that would be my, my question. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Uh, yeah, first question is how not to be too academic. <laughs> Gopi, please. Gopi, please. I don't want the academic answer this one. You first. You're in the private sector. Are you a company? 
Thank you, our company. Okay, one of the things that you can do from a practical standpoint, because you're not going to influence policy. No, we are. But, you know, but, it, well, when you say influence policy, in the sense that if you're a company, you will follow policy, right? You advocate. <coughs> you're an, you do advocacy, is it? So we do influence policy because we are now working very closely with the government on policies uh, that affects, like for example, biodiversity. We work with Bursa, for example, to promote the TCFD, for example, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. So what we do is, as corporation, we need to make sure that governments do not make policy that the, the corporations cannot imp, uh, implement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the National Biodiversity Advers uh, Advisory Group uh, that we are working together is to help to implement the 22, 21 targets of the uh, Global Biodiversity Forum that was, uh, you know, um, in, in, in uh, COP15 of Kunmin, Montreal. So we do. Uh, that's part of what we do. I mean, we work with MPOA, the Malaysian Palm Oil Association, works together with the Malaysian um, Palm Oil Board, with the Malaysian, um, uh, 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 you know, industries, uh, um, primary industry, MPIC, to, to make sure that, you know, policies, like, for example, the EUDR, the EU deforestation regulation, um, you know, it's something that we can implement, yes. So policies are very important for us. Okay. So in the case of your particular company, uh, it seems to me that you've answered your own question. You're already playing a role, and you're playing the role at a policy level. But I want to answer your question in a more generic. How can the private sector play a role, rather than just your company? Uh, I, I, I'm no doubt what you're doing is already very credible in terms of conveying... Uh, your inputs to the government. The main thing the government faces in terms of having to do biodiversity is the fact that there are gaps in the institutions. This could be in terms of uh, people, in terms of processes. Now, one of the things is to advocate for these, for processes to be strengthened. That's one way of doing it. The other thing is to actually be involved on the ground for things that need to be done. There's no way, for instance, i give you an example. If you went to Sembilan Islands, these are very beautiful islands, they've got a coral reef, but they just do not have enough people going down trying to clear nets, trying to uh, uh, remove debris. Well, I've dived down there and you know, I can see tin cans and stuff like that. Now, you may think that these are small things, and they are, in the, but in the, in the greater scheme of things, they are things that an institution be, should be doing. Government should be doing, and it cannot. It simply does not have the resources. So this is something that private sector can be involved in. The only thing is that when it, it's involved as a volunteerism, if you're calling for volunteerism, it doesn't have staying power. I do it all today, and then I go home, and perhaps one year later, I come back for the next company get together, and we do it again. So this is where what you need to do is work with existing agencies and try and do this on a more permanent basis, organize something on a more permanent basis. Uh, one example of an NGO who has done that quite successfully would be Reef Check. That's worked extensively in Tioman. But she can only work with Tioman because that's all the resources it's got. But it works with Marine Parks, now Fisheries Department, in doing a lot of this kind of work. So, but it's an NGO. But it's a body, it acts like a corporate body as well. But what it requires is funding, it requires volunteers, it requires hands-on. And that's where private sector can play a role. That's more on the practical side. I, I think you misunderstand. My question is how can the academics... Sorry? Your presentation is all about academic approach. Yeah. I was asking how that presentation can help us to work together with the private sector to do something, not asking what we're going to, because we are working with a lot of NGOs and we are working a lot. I mean, not talking just me, but other, other private sectors. So I, I think you misunderstand my question. My question is, you know, you've done a lot of research. For example, the gentleman from Indonesia, they've done a lot of research on, on uh, 
the impact of social economy as well as development and and the impact on the environment in terms of the you know so I, I just want to see how that that academic approach can be implemented in a way that we could use it in a practical way so I think to a certain extent there is some example but it's very you know it's it's it, it impacts on a very small level so we, we want to see a bigger impact so I, I just want to s that's well, my question I, I think then you have if you're looking at that as an approach what you're doing right now is inconsistent with that. that I'm mean, sorry, is consistent with that. That approach means there is an engagement with the private sector and the government in terms of what needs to be done. You talk about academia, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm, I, I know the way you're smiling, I'm not answering your question, but I'm not quite, quite clear how, how uh, uh, what exactly you mean. You're asking how academia can play a role. Right? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, you. you know, we had a forum where we invited the academy, uh, the part of the academy into our forum, uh, a Sustainable Consortium Forum. But their approach was very, very academic. They were looking at small details, which is not practical. It might be good at the basic level, but we require a more applicable application okay. approach. In terms of, and I think this is where I'm asking you guys because okay, fine. I, I can see I some of this. you have done yeah. some practical approach. Yeah. I, I think I should pass this to academics because I'm not an academic and uh, I, I sympathize with what you're saying, but I really can't answer that question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your um, question. And actually, I think that is your query. So, actually, um, we are academia. Our our result is a valid result that's needed by any agencies to prove what they need to do next. Because only the expert can provide you the, the valid data so that it will lead you to do what the right um, action after that. So that's a very, very, um, very, I mean, important role from the academy. So, um, what I'm trying to say just now from my department, actually the Ministry of Education now introduced the um, industry and community engagement. So this is totally not a research project. This is actually an engagement to the industry or the community. So we try to, um, to engage everyone, not only we call it a quadruple helix, but now we are going to a pentahelix collaborations means that everyone have to um, do their roles to make it to fulfill the, the missions of the country. So there's no single organizations can implement uh, very big missions without a collaboration with this. That's why the, the, the government come out with this module. We need when, uh, quadruple helix is not enough. Now we're going to pentahelix. But you can't say that the very the academic produce a very detailed is it not practical? Actually, that's the very important things to prove what your actions is valid or not. So you you can't say just um, I want to um, to kill some of the elephant without a very um, um, I mean uh, a valid data, and then it's not everyone's. Uh, very, very verified can verify the data and valid the validation of the data is only come from the experts. So um, a, a public cannot 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 give the, the information. So you still need that to, to support your, your actions. But from the academic side, we are limited to only academic. We don't have this um, the limitation is we are not doing the action, the implementation which is now, I think the, the, the company or the, uh, most of the private sectors are going to a new era um, to comply the ESG, I think, mm -hmm. economic, social, and governance. That's why they have to have the certification of this so that each of us have to, um, again, relate to the communication. We have to work together to make it um, uh, um, to make it um, how applicable. applicable, yeah. So maybe 
I think my other uh, colleague can give more um, explanation on it. Be before you do that, I just want to say something. This distinction between I'm doing something practical and they're doing something academic is an entirely a, a theoretical construct. You, as long as you, the party you're working with can engage with you, I think they're bringing inputs to the table, you're bringing inputs to the table, and you can come up with something. Yeah. But if we start dividing it like this, then it, it, it doesn't work. Fine, the individual that you spoke to or you're dealing with might be very theoretical in the way they look at things. But we must be very mindful of this, that everybody brings something to the table. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I agree with you uh, that as the academia, we do less action research. Uh, but the number of action research is increasing. But we also cannot avoid the fundamental research uh, because that contributed the core knowledge. So to enhance the core knowledge, uh, the fundamental research needed, but uh, we must have the balance of our research activities. So here also, SDG, uh, we need to balance in every sector. So in addition to that, uh, from my experience uh, working with the business sector, uh, as i shown in the slide, the Franjipani Hotel and Spa. So, they want to promote, uh, I mean, their revenue, but they want green practices, and they also want good reputation. Hmm. So uh, they're aiming how they contribute to the sustainable development uh, of the country. So what they do, they uh, uh, invite academia to monitor their water quality their grey water, the, uh, the channel to the constructed wetland before discharge to the water body and other sources. So as an entrepreneur, he can do in line with the government policy and national policy, but someone need to monitor, validate that he is doing what he is doing, doing correctly and what he is releasing to the environment is safe for the environment. To go through this process, he need academia or expert, from, especially from the academia, because this is, uh, if looking for the long-term sustainability, he need, of course, the academic research on it. So in a way, academia contributing to the business sector uh, to, uh, to help them to comply with the national policy. And when they have these uh, uh, successful constructed wetlands, of course, they have uh, reduced their uh, expenses of treat, uh, treating the water. This is one example. There is another example of uh, uh, counting the water footprint. If you offer us counting the ecological footprint or water footprint of your company, we can also able to help you also. So this also uh, help you to comply with the ESG or other uh, standards uh, from the Malaysia or international. So I think this is one of the way we can contribute to the, uh, can do collaboration with the business and industry sector. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Silica, Prof. Okay. Thank you. Uh, based on my experience, uh, usually I give some uh, policy brief because some of the private sectors, like uh, they want to with to get the tech incentive or something like that, but the government usually uh, reluctant to give the tax uh, incentive or other thing like that, and we. Just uh, make uh, uh, policy brief. What is the impact uh, of the tax incentive? So the government see whether the want to give the tax incentive or not. This is based on my two experience uh, about the tax property on forest because this is like uh, to make 
the tax property to reduce the tax property on uh, forest production so become a sustainable development uh, can be applied because most of the owner of the uh, company and, and the forest uh, like to produce the I mean to re reforest the the land so they can get a tax incentive that's I mean the, the improvement to to continue sustainable development another things that when I give some uh, policy brief about the green industry green industry they, they need to have some tax incentive uh, fiscal incentive how to to get the fiscal incentive because they comply with the green policy so why what is the benefit if I comply with the green uh, industry so they need to give some uh, fiscal incentive so I give some policy brief and they can uh, each other to negotiate how is uh, to give better for the economy as a whole that's my uh, my my experience to give the government this is good for the economy as a whole we lost a revenue in some sectors but we give some the the benefit of the whole economic sectors that's all thank, thank you. you yeah that was a long discussion <laughs> we have uh, 12 minutes uh, for question number two i think uh, lavania referred to one of your slides minas uh, thank you uh, uh, for the question actually that's the fundamental issue and to me, uh, to address those, uh, those issues, education is important. Uh, when not talking about only the school, primary, tertiary level education, when, the, uh, when they enter in the professional sector, for example, they're coming from uh, monodiscipline sector, in a position, he need to do multitasking work. So he might also need education and training, a special customized training to be uh, on multidisciplinary approaches, so can be multitasking. So in a way, the training should also embedded the uh, ethics and integrity. So when these are embedded, in a training program, and those are practiced in real activities. Gradually, the situation can be improved. This you can hope. So I may ask my other colleague, they can also contribute on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, going beyond uh, GDP is not easy, but certainly we can work together. And if I could remember, under SDSN, they have formed the Transformation Centre. What we are trying and discussing is try to move from business as usual to something better. After listening to Guterres, Antonio Guterres, and so many leaders who delve into sustainable development, we are lagging behind in terms of all the SDGs. Only 15%, I think, if I saw the figure, that we are on track. So that's why SDSN, if you Google the Transformation Center, hopefully you will you'll find some answer, including Zurina. Uh, for example, Global Geopark. We academic, we come with theoretical framework. Ibrahim Como and team come with you know, the concept of geo heritage, geo this, geo that. But it took some time, like uh, Dr. Gopi mentioned, bring something to the table. And with Global Geopark Langkawi, the first Global Geopark of Southeast Asia, and also first in Malaysia, of course, we took a long time first working with Langkawi Development Authority. Then we also bring in the small medium enterprise. That's why today, with the knowledge of geology, never that geologists would have imagined it can open up business opportunity for the fishermen of Langkawi. Fishermen who were poor then, 
with low income today are owning boats that are being operated by their children and grandchildren and can earn. You know why? Because now when they look at rocks of Langkawi, there are the scientific stories that can be turned into information and books. We even try to figure out if a international tourist come to Langkawi, there are currently 30 geosites, it will come to, ah, huh, this is a funny looking rock, but it has a 500 million year old fossil. So what we are thinking, you do something with information from the handphone, we can charge one US dollar, 10 cents will go to the researcher, X cents go to your company, X cents go to the community, uh, that sort of thing. But this sort of thing need to happen through communication and collaboration. Three days ago, I read a newspaper article. There was a meeting in Awana Genting, C-A-N. Ah. Yeah, CEO Action Network. What was the keyword in the newspaper? Collaboration. That's it. Academic, yeah, we are with formulas and framework. Please bring us in and start talking. And in, in fact, in that, somewhere I read, nowadays what's popular with companies are CSOs, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer. And CSO, a few years back, only talked about CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Projects. But nowadays, no. They need to sit down with, they call it the stakeholders and investor. So now you've got to go beyond. What do investors want? What do stakeholders want? But the answer is sit down together. And it may take a few years, but it's going to be worth it. It will bring Ringgit Malaysia billions of dollars maybe, inshallah. Uh, before we forget the third question, Sekejap, eh? the group from CAN are very excited. Uh, yes, the third question about uh, fragmentation. We, are, we get caught into fragmentation of doing things. Government officers say, oh, when there's a problem, ah, that's not my problem, that's the other ministry's problem. Yeah? Ah, Papa, since you, you laugh the loudest, you answer. Uh, I think this is the, the role of a, scien a scientific uh, ac uh, an academician because uh, we we stand in the in the middle so we can uh, accommodate all of the interests so we try to put it together between the private sectors and all of the stakeholder in objective sense so we put it which is the 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 best things for the the community i think so yeah thank you thank you if i don't let one of the speakers of the cen speak they're going to be angry with me please one of you you have 3 minutes hi everybody good afternoon i'm, I'm from genting and we recently had the cen which was very exciting and uh, one very extraordinary event. Um, now into, uh, into another one. Now I've been to two events already. I just want to uh, not make a comment, but maybe make a request. Uh, that uh, and I agree with this lady in front of me here uh, from IY with her comments, and I fully support her for that. Uh, my request would be for academics uh, to consider about aesthetization. Uh, what we are experiencing in Genting Highlands is uh, we have done a lot of data and found out how many oh. uh, types of endemic plants that we have, Good. the type of wildlife that we have. Uh, but then again, when, my, when we ask for capital expenses and the boss will say, uh, how much do you need? Mm. And I say, so much, so much money. And he says, uh, what really is our biodiversity worth? You see? And I said, well, uh, Tan Sri, you've got uh, one black panther, you've got 200 siamangs, mm. you've got many, many endemic species of plants on your land, and you are the largest owner of wildlife. But uh, then he said, how much they're worth? And so I realized 
that what we're missing today is assetization. We have them, but we don't know what their value is. And it's not going to give me any money from the profits, simply because, uh, well, when I said, uh, I mean, we have F&B, we have hotels, uh, we allocate the money every year from whatever we make, or whatever. But, unfortunately, when it comes to the environment, there's no value. Mm. It's not been assetized yet. Mm. Other than the price of land, mm. but that's it. What's the price of our water? Mm. What's the price of our, our ecosystem? Uh, what's the price of a black panther? I'm not putting it in the, in the way that I know, yeah. uh, you put a price so that you put them in trouble, mm. but I'm saying that we want to protect what we have, but we don't know the value. Mm. And hopefully, academicians can uh, help us uh, do this research. Yes. Uh, and come back to us that this is the value. If it's one billion ringgit, then I need 100 million. Mm. Or maybe 10 million would do for a start. Good. And then I have... An, I have I have some money. Otherwise, at this moment, uh, I can't even hire an intern. Mm. So it says, uh, whoa, they're going to cost us money. Right. So we're not creating jobs. Mm. Two, uh, we recently had the tax office come over, and after we tell them what we are embarking, and so for our services, there's no tax. Mm. Because they understand that we have to create jobs, we have to educate the public. And in this case, uh, as you can Google, in 2019, we had an excess of 30 million tourists mm. compared to Singapore in 2019 with 19.1. Right. One country on an island and one mountain with one highway mm. to get to the top and one supermarket, mm. if you want to call it that, a large supermarket with a theme park. And we have an excess of 30 million tourists. Mm. And so we need money. Right. But the question here is, uh, and you rightly say it, we have no data. Mm. We have no support uh, for this, but we have already gained a tax relief. Just to share that uh, yeah. with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sir. Thank, thank you very you much for Professor that offer. Martin. What's your name again, sir? Uh, I'm Eddie, sorry. Eddie. Yeah. Right. Terima kasih, Eddie. Yeah, one more minute. Uh, that's my time. Just to close. <laughs> but anyway, I like uh, Eddie's uh, point, which is about value. Uh, so this is where researchers and non-researcher, we can get together and give proper value to natural resources, to bio-D, to everything. When there is value, then we will treasure it and respect it. One thing about Malaysian, when there is a disaster, people come together very quickly and they are willing to help. For example, Malaysia, we have floods. When floods happen, everybody will come and give similar things. But my point is, during peaceful time, you don't see Malaysians coming together. They don't care so much about the river and all that. So how to change this? But anyway, another professional that we need are the psychologists. Psychiatrists are too late already. The psychologists. <laughs> but anyway, it's already 4.15. Uh, I think we better stop here so that we have about five minutes of water management before we come back for the plenary. Let's put our hands together for the wonderful speakers. Thank you.